Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton. Thank you so much for listening today to Family Talk, a radio production of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. I wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about our growing ministry here. This new institute is continuing Dr. Dobson's life work by fighting for marriages and families. It's no secret that our Christian values are under attack, and we must stand up for righteousness and biblical truth unashamedly. We believe this new institute is doing just that. I urge you, take a moment, would you, to learn more at the DobsonFamilyInstitute.com. DobsonFamilyInstitute.com. Aside from our Family Talk broadcast, there are three other divisions through which we're continuing this legacy of work. The first one is our educational partnerships with colleges and universities to encourage the next generation. Secondly is the Dobson Policy Center. It keeps you informed on how the political arena influences the family. And lastly is our online collection of all of Dr. Dobson's work in the Dobson Digital Library. Go to DobsonFamilyInstitute.com. Thanks for standing with us and thanks for being a friend of the family. Today on Family Talk. The Christian faith is established in the inerrancy of God's Word. Unfortunately, today many young people are neglecting these biblical concepts and are therefore very confused in their beliefs. So how do God-honoring parents convey the truth of Scripture in a loving but direct way? Truth without relationships leads to rejection. If we're lacking in one area, It's helping parents, especially the father, to develop that healthy, loving, intimate relationship with their child, where when they share truth and they model truth, that child will want it. This is Family Talk, a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh with your host, psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. James Dobson. Now that familiar voice you just heard was that of today's guest, Josh McDowell. He and his son, Sean McDowell, talked with Dr. Dobson many years ago about passing on a godly legacy. The McDowells highlighted the vital biblical principles every believer must impart to the next generation. Josh also shared how a very painful childhood warped his worldview for many years. Now, before we get to this important presentation, let me tell you a little bit about our guests. Josh and Sean McDowell are best-selling authors, apologists, and passionate voices for the Christian faith. This father-son duo are both graduates of Talbot Theological Seminary and have delivered countless speeches around the world. They've also co-authored many books together, including the source for today's broadcast titled The Unshakable Truth. With that said, here now is their insightful conversation with Dr. James Dobson on this classic edition of Family Talk. Passing along your belief system to the next generation is job one. Because if you don't get those kids into the hands of Christ, you'll never see them again. I mean, that is the ultimate responsibility. And uh, we have uh, two guests with us today that are great friends of mine. I'm delighted to have them back. They've written a new book, and we're going to talk about it today. Uh, Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell, uh, we were just talking, Josh. Uh, this is maybe your 24th time to work with us in the yep, studio. Yep, and I'm ju- you're just starting to teach me the tricks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> there are no tricks. You just go for it. <laughs> but uh, it is uh, exciting to see you. And you said something in my office a few minutes ago that I want to repeat. Now, you said that your prayer before the Lord is that of all the books you've written, which is uh, close to 115, is that 130, I think it is 130 books, uh, that this is the one that you pray the Lord will bless the most. Uh, the title of it is The Unshakable Truth, How You Can Experience the 12 Essentials of a Relevant Faith. And it gets to the heart of that matter of transferring what you believe to a, a culture that is at war with the family and at war with the church. Is that the essence of what you, you and, uh, and Sean are doing here with this book? I've never written in an area that is so critical at the very moment in the body of Christ. I don't like to call it a crisis. I like to say we have some overwhelming challenges, and you hit on it when you said we are not 
passing our faith on to the next generation. And when that happens, the church dies. Doesn't that break your heart? Oh, it does. I mean, uh, just walk on a high school or college campus and look around, and uh, you, you can just see in the behavior. Go to the mall on Friday night and uh, see what the kids are caught up with. They don't get it. They don't know who Christ is or what he can do in their lives. Well, Jim, maybe I'm off base on this, but walk into the average Christian home. And I would shake my head and say, they don't get it. Because much of what you see in high school and universities are not a reflection of the university and everything. It's a reflection of their home, especially the relationship with their father. Truth without relationships leads to rejection. If we're lacking in any one area, it's helping parents, especially the father, to develop that healthy, loving, intimate relationship with their child, where when they share truth and they model truth, that child will want it. In preparation for a three and a half hour DVD I just finished called The Bare Facts on Sex, Love, and Dating, I did a lot of research, secular research. One of the things that surprised me, Jim, was this. Three different studies showed that everybody talks about peer pressure and sexuality, you know, from your peers and the culture and Hollywood and everything. These secular studies show there's one thing all the way through high school and university up to 25 years that totally overrides Hollywood, everything, totally overrides their peers. It's the relationship with their father. Far more powerful than their peers. And you know something about that because you had a bad relationship with your father. Well, my dad, as I've shared many times, was the town alcoholic. You know, in the embarrassment put up, making a fool of himself downtown and all, beating my mother to a point where she couldn't stand up. Um, I wish I never grew up hating my dad. Because, Jim, I think every day of my life I paid a price for it, even after coming to Christ. And that had a profound effect because, see, because my dad was always drunk. Now, this sounds dumb, but what it said to me, I was not worth having a relationship with. It affected my self-image and everything. Yeah. Because if I'd been a good kid and my dad really loved me, he never would have gotten drunk. Yeah. I didn't realize I had nothing to do with the problem. And the other is— and. I don't know if I've ever shared this even with you, Jim. Uh, I've just come kind of public with it. Between 6 and 13 years of age, I was homosexually raped almost every week for seven years. It has nothing to do with suppression of memory. No, it has to do with a man named Wayne Bailey. When I was six years old, my parents hired him to be a, a cook and a housekeeper on the farm. From that moment on, whenever my mother went downtown shop, my parents went away. Mm-hmm. My mother would grab me by the shirt and march me into Wayne Bailey. And in front of him and say, now you obey him. You do everything he tells you to do. And if you're disobedient, you're going to get a thrashing when I got home. So what'd you do? You did everything Wayne Bailey told you. At did nine did year, your mother know what was going At nine years on? old and 12 years old, I went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. And Jim, you, you can't put into you know. words what you feel like at that moment. The only emotion I can really experience from that was an overwhelming fear. I still have that today. If I Say, if I was in this room alone and I was focused on something, anyone here walked into this room, any man walked in this room, even today, a tremendous emotion of fear will sweep over me just for a second or two. I have people come up, Jim, all the time, like they'll say to you, well, let's gather around Josh and pray for him. And I say, no, right in front of a huge congregation, I say, no, please don't. Why? Every time, every single man that's ever laid this out, pastor, anyone, or group of people, every time they'll touch you on the shoulder, every time, they don't even know, they start to rub you. Every person does it. And you get a flashback. And that's exactly what happened. He'd come up from behind me, and he would start rubbing my shoulders. And when somebody does that now, all those flashbacks come back. But I know my past. I know who I am. I know what's happened in my life. But I'll tell you this, Jim. If I hadn't come to Jesus, I don't know what had happened in my life. And 
if the man who led me to Christ had not mentored me for six months and said, Josh, you need to forgive him. I said, no way, I want him to burn now. But I did it out of obedience. I didn't feel like forgiving him, but I did. Oh, my gosh. It was like a big burden rolling off. I've learned this one thing. There's nothing too great in my life for God's power to deal with, nor anything too insignificant for his love to be concerned about. And I'm a walking, living example of that. And without understanding that, I wouldn't be in this program with you today, Jim. I wouldn't have my relationship that I have with my son. How did you get through the teen years with that kind of abuse going on? I mean, how did you come to know what it means to to be a man? Well, at 13 years of age, I was playing football and working a farm, and my mother gone downtown. He came up behind me. I swirled around, cut my hand around his neck, threw him up against the wall and said, if you ever touch me again, I'll kill you. He never touched me again. I would have killed him. Jim, one of the hardest things was living, excuse me, with the shame of it. Yeah. But I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. But it was a trend. Back then, you have to understand, no one talked about it. Right. But that shame. I went through life fearing people because I had no control over it. But you know what? I like who I am today, Jim. And I wouldn't be who I am. If God hadn't walked me through all those things. See, that explains why you talk so often about fathering. Uh, you teach about being a good father and, and the relationship with your son. Uh, how did you get over that? Uh, you did not accept the tenets of the Christian faith. I mean, they were there for you. But you say in the book that uh, you really had a struggle. Oh, I I struggle to this day, Jim. Every day I have a struggle with it. But apart from this man mentoring me, and this is why, Jim, I develop such deep convictions, not just that the Bible is true intellectually, but it changes lives. My life has been changed through the very principles this man taught me from the scriptures. And I remember I had so much fear going to him. And, and I was afraid to tell him. I didn't want to be hurt again. It hurts to be rejected. Yeah. And finally, I got up the courage. I drove about 35 miles to tell him. Sat there for a half hour. He had to wonder, why is he even here? Finally, I just blurted out, and he believed me. Mm. That was like being born again. Yes. And then he said, will you meet with me? Oh, my gosh. And I saw the Word of God take effect in my life, dealing with sin, How dealing with you? hatred. How old? I was probably about 19. It was right after I came to Christ. and But... Probably the biggest thing that helped me is the woman I'm married to. I just, I stand in awe of Dottie. I'm the most fortunate man in the world to be married to Dottie. And people say, oh, you have a wonderful family. I said, I know this. I wouldn't have the relationship with my son here and my daughters without Dottie. I would have destroyed everything in my life if God hadn't had me marry someone like Dottie. Sean, it, you have obviously known this for a long time, haven't you? Well, uh, this is not new news. That it is. Is it? I is think it? it was about two years ago, roughly, maybe two or three years, two years ago. ago April. You sat down with us kids, and he said, there's something I want to share with you. I thought you were going to tell us you were dying or something. <laughs> it was really that somber. And then and he shared with us, and just, I mean, we cried and we wept because, you know, mm-hmm. but honestly, to just think of somebody who has everything against him saying he should be a victim he should be you know in jail and and god has transformed his heart whenever i hear people say they're victims i say you know what my dad was in his bad or worse circumstances i don't believe it god you can really change. didn't know that till I, two years ago i did not know that till two I, years have, ago i went and you, shared with dotty why now everyone asks that uh-huh. dotty asked it i just kind of felt it was nobody's business well, I understand now. Why now is it everybody's business? I don't know. I just know I went and I shared it with, I, I called her up and I said, honey, when I get home, I need some time just alone with you. I need to share something. And I know I'd run into a number of people who was just devastated by the same thing. And I shared with them a little bit of what had happened in my life. And they said, why aren't you talking about that? 
And that burdened me. And finally, I went to Dottie. And this shows a woman. I'm, my wife is very private because my life is so public. Yeah, I have the and same she said, there, Yeah, and she's very <laughs> private. People don't need to know about her life. People don't need to know this. And so I sat down and shared with her. And the first thing she did, she started crying. She said, honey, I am so sorry that happened to you. And the next word out of her mouth was, you've got to share this with others. I mean, Jim, that was the last thing I ever expected from my wife. You know, Josh, I, I know you know this, but the children of alcoholics don't like to share the things they've been through. And they hold it within. And they're embarrassed by it, especially when they're younger. And my wife Shirley's father was an alcoholic. And Shirley didn't tell me that until we had been dating for over a year. She held it all in. And then the night that she told me, she really thought I'd walk away from her. And if anything, it gave me a, a, a great desire to protect her and to make up uh, to her for what she had missed and what she'd gone through. Uh, but she still was very private about it for about at least 15 years after that. And I was teaching a Sunday school class, and one day I said to her, Shirley, God's done a miracle in your life, and there are other people out there that are struggling just like you did. You need to tell it. See, that's what Dottie said yeah. to me. And, and she said, oh, I couldn't do oh, never. I couldn't do that. And I said, will you pray about it? And the next Sunday morning, she got up and shared it for the first time. And two things happened. One, she was healed of those memories. Sharing it was like putting sunlight on a dark place. And she was able to deal with it and talk about it after that. And secondly, there were so many people in the audience who came and said, that's me. I've never told anybody I've been through exactly what you have. Well, you know, after I shared with Dottie, I called my kids together, shared with them. And you know Steve Arterburn. Sure. He hosted my, co-hosted my TV show for years, everything. And I greatly respect him. I called him up. He lives not too far from me at the time. And I went over and I shared with him. And he said, one of the first things he said was, Josh, you've got to share this with others. And he started firing all these questions at me. And he said, you know, Josh, where you're unique. And I, I wasn't a believer when I went through all this. But he said, one, you have never, ever looked at yourself as a victim. And I said, that's true. I've never looked at myself as a victim. But he said, second, where a healthy thing, a decision you made that you probably didn't even realize the time is, I never looked at myself as damaged goods. Even when you were a kid? Even when I was I, a kid. I thought that's where you were going After with 13, the story 14, in the beginning. 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, even as a non-believer without Christ's influence in my life, I never looked at myself as a victim, and I never looked at myself as damaged goods. But with Shirley, you just hit on something I think is true in my life. Say, why didn't you share it before? Now, this probably seems so unchristian, so immature, everything. But I felt if I shared it that people would never, ever look at me the same again. Yeah. And they don't, whether good or bad. Yeah. yeah. Because now, every time anyone sees me, hears me, everything, they'll say, oh, he was sexually abused. Yeah. And, you know, even with the maturity I had in Christ and everything else, that was something I had to deal with. But, you know, God used other people. And this is why I say to people, don't go it alone. You won't make it. Josh, we really can't leave that story without carrying it through to conclusion. Wayne Bailey, I understand that he died seven, eight years ago. I believe so. Uh, did you carry anger and resentment to him to his death? Oh, and is absolutely it, not. Is it still there within your no. heart? Uh, what, what has God done with that? Remember I shared that the man who led me Christ mentored me for six yeah. months. At the end, he, he said something I didn't want to hear. I knew it was true, but I didn't want to hear. He said, Josh, you need to forgive him. But I knew the Bible was true. I knew com God commanded me to forgive, and it would be honoring to him. So I did it not out of any good feeling. I did it out of obedience. I was in Battle Creek, Michigan. I drove up to Jackson, Michigan, knocked on the door. When he answered the door, I said, Wayne, what you did to me was evil, very evil. But I've come here to tell you that I've come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I want you to know, 
And what I told him, Jim, I didn't want it to be true. I knew it was true, but I didn't want it to be. I said, Wayne, I've come here to tell you that Jesus died as much for you as he did for me. I forgive you. If I hadn't have done that, I would have probably died years ago. Carried it through you yeah. the rest of your life. Yeah. But I want you to understand, I'm still dealing with a lot of things in my life, Jim. Why? Well, but I, it's a process. Uh, and I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be by God's grace. Mm. You know, the illustration that I've heard before is if you were beaten with a whip until your back was bloody, and then you came to Christ, you would still have the scars there but they would have healed over. You know, you still have the scars of your childhood, but you're not bitter and you're not angry and you didn't want to kill him. I control anymore. them now. They don't control me by God's grace. Uh, we are talking to many people today who have experienced that. That's the tragic thing. It is happening so commonly today. And, uh, and they hold it in and they don't tell anybody. And yet, maybe we can liberate some of those people in Christ. And you can reach a generation that uh, maybe Josh reaches, but uh, fewer people uh, who are 20 and 25 and 30 are hearing it from anybody and maybe not from me and us. And I appreciate you guys being willing to do that. Let's talk about that next time. And for Pete's sake, let's talk about your book. Oh, that's right. That's we were going to talk here. about that, weren't we? <laughs> hey, Josh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you for opening that uh, part of your life. I never knew that. I t- we said at the top of the program that I've interviewed you now 24 times. I've never known that. Obviously, uh, God is taking you into a new chapter whereby you will be in a position to minister to those who are wounded and broken as a result of the abuse, either physical, emotional, or homosexual that the adults in this culture have inflicted upon them. And I pray that you'll continue to do it. Thanks for being with us, and we'll talk about it some more next time. Sounds great. You got it. Well, this is Family Talk, and you've been listening to Dr. James Dobson's conversation with Josh and Sean McDowell. I'm Roger Marsh, and I know today's broadcast was tough to listen to because of Josh's horrific childhood, but I pray his message of hope and Christ's redemption got through to you. Visit drjamesdobson.org to learn more about Josh and Sean's ministry and their book, The Unshakable Truth. That's drjamesdobson.org, and then click onto the broadcast page. As we conclude today's program, I want to remind you that this ministry relies entirely on your continuous contributions. Each and every day, we are grateful for the generous support of listeners just like you. Learn how you can partner with us by visiting drjamesdobson.org or by calling 877-732-6825. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Dr. James Dobson's classic conversation with Josh and Sean McDowell. They'll dive deeper into their book about conveying truth to the next generation. For moms and dads listening, you will definitely want to hear what they have to say. That's all coming up next time right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Adolescence has always been a time of unusual stress, but many teenagers today are being asked to handle more than they can bear. Dr. James Dobson for Family Talk. Recently, the Denver Post carried a report from a convention of the American Psychological Association. The usual array of studies was presented, but this time many of them repeated the same theme. The epidemic of broken homes is extracting a terrible price in the lives of teenagers. One study found found that kids from one-parent families are more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs, especially when the separated parent loses contact with them. A
report from a Long Beach college says that student counseling centers are looking more and more like community health clinics routinely dealing with suicide attempts and psychosis. And Maureen Kenny of Boston College notes that fewer kids these days want to rebel against their families. They're more likely to say instead, I wish there was someone I could be close to. Is there any doubt that our society has been heading down the wrong road for the last two decades? Now more than ever, we as parents must resist the pressures that pull at our marriages and our families. We can't give our teenagers a perfect world, but we can certainly give them a sound, stable base for growing into adulthood. They deserve no less. To find out how you can partner with Family Talk, go to drjamesdobson.org. This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. I want to thank you for joining us for our broadcast today. You may or may not know that Family Talk is a listener-supported program, and we remain on the air by your generosity. If you can help us at all financially, we would greatly appreciate it. Dr. Dobson's been fighting for the family for over 40 years now, and he's not about to stop, believe me. Here's Roger Marsh with more information on how you can support the ministry of Family Talk. And friend, thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825.